Hi everyone. Today, Booktopia will be hosting two legends in the medical world. We're just making sure that Dr. Norman Swan, um, host of Radio National's Health Report, co-host of CoronaCast and commentator on ABC TV's 7.30, um, will be able to join us. And we welcome Dr. Ben Bravery, a zoologist, cancer survivor and doctor in that order. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, just be patient as we invite our guests into this Twitter space event. Dr. Bravery, are you there? Hey, Dr. Swan, thank you. Thanks for joining us. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? <laughs> good, good, good. So uh, let's kick this off. Um, hello, everyone listening. Uh, I'm Dr. Ben Bravery, author of a memoir called The Patient Doctor, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, I wanted to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land of which we're all gathered and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend this to any First Nations people listening today. I'm thrilled to be joined by health broadcaster, journalist and author, Dr. Norman Swan. Hi, Ben. <laughs> thanks, and for, thanks for thanks and I'm thrilled to be with uh, <laughs> journalist and broadcaster and nascent <laughs> psychiatrist uh, Dr. Brian Bravery. Please, I don't deserve any of those labels. Um, so, uh, look for people listening today. Uh, you can show support uh, by using emojis, which will pop up, and Norman and I will see those. Um, especially if you've bought Norman's book or ordered it. Uh, so you want to live younger, longer. Um, and if you haven't already got Norman's book, you can get a copy of it right now at booktopia.com.au. Now, Dr. Swan, you are a legend in the medical and public health spaces. Uh, I wanted to start with what you, what you wanted to be when you were growing up and how that may have changed over the years. Oh, well, what I wanted to be when I grew up, when I was in, when I was an adolescent, I wanted to be an actor. Excellent. That was my, that was my goal in life. <laughs> I was obsessed with the theatre. I used to go to the theatre by myself. I grew up in a family that didn't have books, didn't have newspapers. Mm. If I was listening to the equivalent of Radio National, which is Radio 4, the home service and BBC, um, I was told to turn off the noise. Mm. Um, and the uh, so the... Um, but and I, and I would go to the theatre by myself. I suppose I was a theatre nerd. <laughs> Excellent. So, and when did when did the kind of the acting dream uh, fizzle out, or or what happened? How did you transition from that to medicine? Uh, well, it, it fizzled initially quite early. I did a lot of acting when I was a kid, yeah. and then. Um, basically try telling a Jewish mother that her son, the doctor, was going to be her son. Her son, the actor, did yeah. not go down, did go down well. And uh, there was a lot of pressure. And, and I did come to the conclusion that, you know, 93% unemployment mm. in acting mm. was probably, you know, there was probably a better chance that I was going to be a more successful second-rate doctor <laughs> than a second-rate actor. So I actually went to medical school at the age of 17. Wow. After, yep. after year 11. And I, equivalent of year 11 in Scotland. And the, um, but it was always there. So I did a lot of acting and directing at uh, university. Mm, excellent. And then when I, gra and when I graduated, I, you know, I was doing a one or two roster in London. But I was, I was still feeling that essentially, um, I'll tell, it's a long story, but I'll, I'll tell a little bit of it. Yeah. Uh, the, Glasgow, the Glasgow Citizens Theatre was one of the best rep repertory theatres in Scotland, in the, U in the United Kingdom. Yeah. And, but it, and, it's special, and it was in the middle of the Gorbals, which was you know, a slum yeah. area of Glasgow. Yeah. And it was famous, internationally famous, for its work on Ibsen and Brecht. Was, outside the Berlin or Ensemble, it was considered the best exponent of Brecht, at least in, mm. in the 1670s. And they, but anyway, at one point they put on Ibsen's last play and Ibsen's last play I, I won't tell you the whole story but nonetheless Ibsen's last play is a, is a is essentially a memoir of regret by the uh, by Ibsen and there's a play mm. a play a writer as the main character mm. and oh have we have we lost you Dr. Swan Mm, I seem to have lost Dr. Swan. Uh, Booktopia, are you able to chime in? 
Yeah, we, we seem to have maybe temporarily lost um, Dr. Norman Swan, but maybe in the interim, Ben, do you want to share a little bit about your book? Yeah, I will. Oh, I was really hanging on that story. I felt like something amazing was about to happen with that play. Um, and how interesting to think about how we start off in life and where we end up. I mean, Norman's story is a great example of something you want to be and then find yourself um, end up end up being something quite different. So my, my story is I, I was a zoologist, so I was into science and wildlife and studying animals. And I was mainly interested in large mammals and how to save them which uh, took me to China and uh, I thought, why not try and save wildlife where, you know, humans and wildlife are really battling it out. And I'd been, I'd been there about four years when I uh, started to develop symptoms, uh, diarrhea, constipation, uh, a bit of bleeding in the toilet. And, uh, you know, I put it off for a long time, mainly because I was busy building a business, uh, just fallen in love. Uh, and I was otherwise really fit and healthy with no family history, but I had a colonoscopy and it found a, a whopping great big tumor down in the bowel. So I was 28, but a, ended up being a stage three cancer diagnosis. And I ended up needing a lot of treatment about a year and a half altogether, uh, radiation, chemo, surgery. And at the end of that, I went back to my old world of science and communications, but I suddenly didn't feel right took a couple of years though to work that out my body had changed definitely scars and chemotherapy side effects my bum certainly wasn't the same uh, but it took a little longer to appreciate that my mind had changed too that maybe my values had and so I took a year off regrouped and decided that I was going to go be a doctor and I thought of that for two reasons one is there were while the technical care was amazing um, that I received and I'm alive because of it there was a lot about the healthcare system that frustrated me, particularly the hospital experience as a patient. And so I wanted to work on that. And I thought I could go back into the system as a doctor and, and try and fix that. And so I took myself off to medical school and ended up uh, training as a doctor. And I'm now four years out of medical school and have decided to kind of put it all together in the book, the patient memoir. But, it, you know, I think, I think we may just have got Norman back online. Um, but it's a, you know, th there's a lot of parallels in, in kind of thinking about what you did want to be and what you end up being and how one informs the other. Um, clearly, Norman's acting skills and his ability to engage an audience have translated really well, uh, both in his training as a paediatrician, um, where those skills are, are front line, but also obviously as a very talented broadcaster. Um, so, yeah, there's, lot, there's some nice similarities uh, between the two journeys. I don't claim to have achieved anywhere near as much as Norman has, though. I'm still a baby doctor by all measures, uh, not quite uh, fully qualified as an independent specialist. That takes a long time. But uh, working on it, yeah, working on it. Uh, how are we going, Booktopia? Getting Norman back. Yeah, sorry, Ben. We're, we're just trying to make sure Norman can reconnect. So by all means, um, I mean, what you just shared with everyone around your story is, is obviously fascinating and, and definitely one can only imagine of the struggles that you've had to mm. face. Um, but maybe perhaps in the meantime, um, you know, you've made a transition into, into the medical space. What's that been like for you? <laughs> it's intense. Um, I, I guess I went into medical school quite naive about what was going to uh, be involved and the road that was ahead of me. Um, and I'm actually might be able to talk about that with Norman because it sounds like we've got him back on. Nor Dr. Swan. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, That's okay. Welcome back. Um, <laughs> is, that is that dodgy Australian internet? Well, it must be. It must be. Sorry about that. <laughs> now, I, we, I had to pick up because you left us at a fascinating point uh, in an in a important play being put on. And I felt like that was going somewhere. Do you mind picking that up again? Oh, sorry. But you were in the middle of your own reflection. Well, okay. So very, very briefly, um, I don't know where I got to. So this, this is Ibsen's last play. And it's a, yes, it's, yes, it's yes, a play yes. about regret. And, um, and it's seared into my brain and probably changed my brain forever, the way adolescent brains can be changed. Mm. And, and I've yeah. spent the rest of my life wanting to do things that, you know, not wanting to get to the end of my life and look back and wish there were all the things that I've done. And, um, and mm. after I graduated in medicine, 
I, you know, the frustration came back. I failed at an audition to RADA, came to Australia and mm. tried to start writing and then ended up with a job at the ABC. So, I'm, you know, I've been at the ABC mm. ever since. I mean, I've only, I haven't had very many jobs in my life. And, um, you know. <laughs> but the ones you've had, you've done well. Look, Can we say of, that? Yeah. <laughs> now, and I, I, what I was reflecting on while you dropped out and came back in was um, sometimes, sometimes I get, I just did an event in Brisbane and one of the questions I had was how did being a zoologist uh, inform me as a doctor and my approach to medicine? Um, and it's, it's not obviously uh, directly related, but I was thinking back to your experience as an actor. Um, how, how did that, how did those skills play out in the patient doctor relationship because you did train in pediatrics am i right i did but i was actually going to do psychiatry originally and i got accepted onto there a you training go. scheme in the united states but i decided i'd get yeah. a more general medicine experience and um and i and i liked pediatrics and i dropped the idea of psychiatry so i mean i've just um, always been interested in communication and broad- mm. broadcasting you know it's interesting broadcast journalism is partly about acting um Good mm. broadcast journalists are actors as well because you've got to, it's not that you're not authentic, but it's that you've got to be very careful about how you communicate. So you've got to get the story um, in the same way as a print journalist does, but also there are all these um, communicate other communications going on. It's simpler in radio where it's just audio, but in television, your body posture, how you look, um, how your, mm. your tone, um, when you interject and so on is all part of, of that process, and I, and I think also my interest in psychiatry made a huge difference. I I, I often approach an interview um, like the standard psychi- psychiatric interview. Um, <laughs> Excellent. And, um, and I was influenced early on in my broadcast career by uh, uh, Sir Anthony Clare, who was professor of initially professor of psychiatry at the University of London, then. He moved back to Dublin and he did a 15 minute show on Radio 4 called In the Psychiatrist Chair, where he would do kind of mm. a pseudo psychiatric interview with famous people like Anthony Hopkins, Glenn mm. Jackson and others. Um, oh, where he dug down. And, and essentially it's that notion of uh, so that, that, that has influenced me a lot in broadcasting. It's that notion of don't be afraid of silence. You don't need to talk mm. all the time. Your ears are your most important organ. Um, how you look, mm. how you behave, how you approach it, that could be modeled by the person you're talking to. So if you are mm. confident and you, uh, you know, and, and you, you create an era of comfort around that person, or you might not want to do that, you might want to create an era of discomfort, you, you, know, you plan the interview in a very psychological way. And um, mm. so that... that, that my interest in psychiatry has strongly influenced my interview style. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And obviously the, the, the curiosity that goes with um, that, that kind of specialty well, and that's the, the that's innate. The thing about psychiatry is that you get involved in yeah. people's stories. Um, yeah, stories, absolutely. And their lives. And, and it's only by understanding their stories. There's a Harvard-based psychiatrist um, you know, who talks about narratives and that, that mm. how we often fail in in general medicine, you know, people with diabetes or heart disease or what have you, the, the treatment often fails because you don't understand the patient's narrative. Hundred mm. percent. Now I, I, I'm kind of um, interested in this idea of regret. So you, you talk about this, the importance of this play and, and what it did to your brain because you you open up your new book. Um, so you want to live younger, longer by, by talking about your uncle um, and, and what may have been. Uh, and I, I wondered if you wouldn't mind sharing that. Uh, I, know, I know it's a personal topic for you, uh, but is I wonder if you wouldn't huge, mind sharing that with our listeners today. Smoke, uh, <laughs> I am not analyzing you, but this one, I'm not <laughs> no, qualified. No, no, yeah. um, <laughs> look, um, I freely admit to having a fear of death which mm. I date back to when I was about eight years old. Um, and I mean, the, you know, people do say that people, people who are fear death are, it's, they're egoistical and they can't imagine a world without them in it, <laughs> which is probably, you know, probably an element of truth there, which I'd share with <laughs> Philip Adams. But the, um, the, um, but the, 
Yeah, when I was eight, I had an uncle. My father was an only child. My mother had one brother. And so that was my only uncle or aunt. You know, I had no uncles, first degree uncles or aunts. So he was my only uncle. And he died at the age of 28 of, of leukemia. And, um, but I never found that out till some time afterwards. Mm. We knew he was sick. We were going to visit him in hospital. Um, and there was a period, and, you know, my mother and her mother were always crying because they were upset about him and you could understand that. But he died and nobody, and it was never told. And, mm. um, and I kept on asking, why are we going to see him? And eventually my mother sat me down and told me, but she said, I'm telling you on the condition that you never mention his name again. And we don't ever talk about him because it's going to upset me and it's going to upset your grandma. And, mm. um, and that created a kind of aura of what was this thing called death. And I, I, I used to get nightmares. And, and, and even today, I, I can go into a cold sweat thinking about death. But, interest, but mm. interestingly, I have actually confronted death uh, a couple of times in my life. And on, ni- on yeah. neither occasion was I paralyzed by an existential crisis. It's this abstract mm. notion. I, I mean, I, I'd be interested in your reflection on that because it's the it's the slow moving crash that I kind of uh, that I think about uh, rather. So, in the two two episodes that I'm talking about, there were there, there was an immediate threat. It was in a bus that blew up, for example, when I was fourteen. Mm-hmm. Now, I you know, you just got on with it in terms of that, and I I, mm. I, I wasn't paralyzed by fear of dying. But it's that like existential. I mean, do you have that, Ben? I mean, you got you went through this incredibly traumatic experience with your with a young person having bowel cancer and an advanced bowel cancer. I mean, what, what mm. do you? I mean, and, and of course, nobody wants to talk about that with somebody. You want to get on with the treatment and so on. <laughs> what, 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 exactly. But did you have a cold, dark moment in the night? Absolutely. I can, I can a hundred percent relate to that sense of cold panic, um, which sounds weird to describe because it's both hot and cold at the same time. But I, I like, I like this idea of the, in the actual, in the acute crisis, the brain has other things to worry about and it goes into a, you know, adrenaline mode. That's a heightened state of preparedness and action. So at the point of diagnosis, I, didn't have any of the existential angst that I later developed. It, it, it comes much later. And it's often when you're alone. It's often in, at 2 a.m. when you can't sleep. Um, and, and like you, I don't fear the acute um, end of my life. I fear that slow cascade, <laughs> um, the gradual accumulation of risk factors or chronic illness that sends me towards the edge. And I, I wonder if you think is, is a fear of that healthy, is a fear of that motivating? Um, yeah, yes. Um, for me, it's a bit more complicated. Well, this is going to start a conversation about death. I mean, the um, <laughs> your book's about living, <laughs> which is exactly right. I mean, look, what, most, <laughs> what most people want out of their lives, I suspect, is for life to be great and fantastic, and then you fall off the cliff absolutely suddenly. Yeah, and um, yeah, and the reality is that we are without having done very much, we are living younger, longer, it is kind of happening. You know, mm. there, is, there, are, there is a slow accumulation of disabilities. So you get to your 80 or 90, you probably had a hip replacement or a knee replacement. You might have had a stent mm. or two and you're on cholesterol drugs. You know, there may be aches and pains with arthritis, but you're not in bad shape. So it's not as if you've got nothing wrong with you, but life's not necessarily mm. a misery. And, you're, mm-hmm. and, you, and literally, when you're 80 these, today, if you're 80 today, your chances of dying in the next 12 months based on international data, are probably about the same as a 60-year-old 50 years ago. So, I mean, you are, you know, for, for a multiple set of reasons, including probably being physically younger at 80 than, uh, six, than, than an 80-year-old 50 years ago. Um, so that, that is, in fact, happening. And you get sick. Most people get sick two or three years before they die. And, um, and that two or three years is just time-shifted. The uh, that two or three years before you died 50 years ago was in your 60s, and now it's in mm. your 80s and 90s, so it's just time shifted. And so, that I, I you know, speaking personally, just going back to the original thing, I'm not really, 
I'm not I'm, I'm not really worried about that two or three years. It, it's just that slip into darkness. That's what. And as and, yeah. as, and as I say that, I you know, my physically can't see my face because it's audio. I actually yeah. I actually get a bit anxious. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry, Doctor no, Swallows. Let's, no, let's, let's, no, yeah, no, the anxiety is okay. Yeah. Anxiety is okay. Um, I, I love I love this idea of that the, the, there are these you, you, you know your data your book is so well researched um your, or your books always are and there's you know you the way you explain uh lifespan and quality years and years lost um to different diseases we, we won't get into all the technical stuff now but i highly recommend it anyone um you know you talk about this pattern of, of people are aging and they're aging um, um maybe better and that the, there's this time shift to their um, lifespan. But you, you make the amazing point that at every stage of someone's life, there's things they can do. Um, we don't have to be passive participants in this. And there's lots of technology and there's lots of studies to show that things we can do now at any age can help us um, age in a, a, you know, in a healthier way. So maybe this is the, the opportunity for you to, to kind of just summarize the book for us. There's a lot in your book, um, but if you if you've got a couple of minutes to kind of like, you know, what what, what should some why should why should someone pick? There's a famous thing in the Jewish tradition, yeah, um, where this um, uh, Jewish teacher called Hillel, a famous Jewish rabbi and teacher, um, was I can't remember whether he gave the challenge to somebody else or it was his cha- his challenge with his teacher. But, um, you, you know, the, the challenge was um, to sum up the five books of Moses, the Torah, well, the Torah is more than the five, to sum up the Bible uh, in the time that you can stand on one leg. And so this is what you've just asked me to do. And it, and so just, just, to, just to complete the Hillel story, it's, yeah. it was uh, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Mm. Um, so, and that's the premise that, Christians go by as well as Jews. But anyway, um, mm-hmm. so look, here's the essence. One is gene, people get concerned about their genes. You know, the only way I'm going to live long is having parents live long. That's far less true today than it has ever been in human history. Genes matter at the extreme of old age. So if you want to get to 105 or 110, and that's literally the conversation to have at the moment, then your genes start to really kick in at that point. But people are reaching their 90s and, the hundred, and the, their early 100s simply because of the way we live and the way society has been organized. And so don't be nihilistic about it. Your genes do not determine destiny. There's still maybe 40, 50, 60 percent um, available to you in terms of the environment and how you live. Sa- mm. The second thing is basic stuff. When, early on in life, know what people in your family died of and at what age. It would be a tragedy um, if you were eating goji berries all your life and you died of an avoidable cause. So yes. that's so that's uh, know what somebody died. So if there's premature, if people are if there's a pattern in your family of people dying at the age of sixty or developing heart disease, cancer, and so on, understand that, know that in case you need genetic counselling or special screening. In your tw- tw- starting your twenties or thirties, know what your blood, blood pressure and cholesterol are, because there's nothing more pro aging apart from smoking than having a higher than average blood pressure. And you can get that down with lifestyle and so on, your cholesterol. And sometimes you'll find a sky high cholesterol um, in your, with, with a genetic risk, and that could save your life. Get cancer screening when you're later. I mean, obviously you are not in the cancer screening age group, but mm. like, but in your circumstance, you know, the other thing to know about is if you get an unusual symptom and you got an unusual symptom when you were in Beijing, Mm-hmm. Um, when you get an unusual symptom, don't think it can't be me. If you're in the shower uh, and you're a 28 year old woman and you feel a lump, don't assume it can't be me because you feel a lump. The likelihood is that it's a benign lump, but it might not be. You go and get it checked and you don't mess around. And if you get bleeding, bruising, anything, weight loss, anything like that. So these are the basics. And then on top of that, you add. Um, other things. So, for example, having high blood pressure is not a problem or, or life shortening if you get it under control with drugs or mm. lifestyle. And um, and then there's all sorts of other things which probably take too long at this point for me to go into in terms yeah. of um, the brain body interface. 
the brain runs everything in your body, in pretty mm-hmm. much everything in your body. And, you're, and we seem to be sort of perplexed and surprised to discover that th- your psychological state can affect your physical body. Yes, yes. And the, and the brain is tuned to your environment, to your relationships, to pollution, mm-hmm. uh, to chronic stress, if you feel out of control of your life. And that translates into physical messages to the rest of your body. So if you're in a position where you feel out of control of your life, and I'd be interested, uh, once I finish my little spiel, I want to hear about this from you mm-hmm. because I'll come back to that in a minute because I've got a question for you on this. Then that creates the chronic stress, which changes your body into a pro-aging, uh, into a pro-aging state. Your inflammation, your immune system is fired up. Your cardiovascular system is less healthy and so on. And, um, and so the, 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 this is a comprehensive, a comprehensive story. And this idea of loss of control is really toxic. Now, my question to you, Ben, is there have been studies which show that not very far into a cancer journey, people often feel they've lost control of their lives and capacity for decision making. Did that? I mean, I, I find it hard to actually, looking at the book, know whether that you actually experienced that. Yeah, I did. Um, I, there were there were a few points in the experience where I did feel like I had lost control, and sometimes you you can't be in control, right? Like it's it's impossible for me to be awake during the surgery, for example. Um, I don't understand. I didn't understand at the time the physics of radiation therapy or exactly how the chemotherapeutics were going to affect the tumor. Um, there were parts where I had to take a back seat, but then there was this kind of general feeling that, that, that my fate was in the hands of others. Um, some of what I write about in the book, having crossed over from patient to doctor, is um, how some of the system is, is um, built to disempower patients, um, to kind of force them into the, the back seat when, when it's not always necessary. And I, you know, I find reading your books really um, helpful, that both the first one and this one. They're, they're almost I think, books that I go back to over and over again when I'm thinking about um, healthy strategies or I come across a, a study that you know, promises me something. Because during my treatment, I reached out to things that didn't have an evidence base for the reason that I wanted control and that I thought they would help me in a way that other people couldn't or they were things that I could do myself actively. Um, and what I what I like about how you've written about aging and the things you can do is you do say that they're they're basic stuff and they're fundamental, but it can that message can get lost, can't it? Because we are overwhelmed by magic solutions to really basic biological problems such as aging. Yes. And um, and, and in fact, your experience, my understanding of the literature with, about complementary medicine and cancer is that a big driver is, is exactly what you said, is that mm. there's, a, there's a very high utilization. People don't abandon their traditional care, but they do take on extra extra you know, modalities and they do it as partly to assert control and feeling that I'm doing something that I'm making the decision about. But, I mean, what I do talk about the supplement industry in the book and people would mm. assume that you know if they listen to my broadcast i'm going to say this all but complete bloody bullshit <laughs> the, but in fact it's not yes um, i like that yes so, so there's all these anti-aging compounds around and it's not a complete fraud because they should work i'm not talking i'm not i'm not talking about mad stuff but i'm talking well, I mean, there is there is some interesting stuff. I'll get to in a minute. You know, about stem cell therapy. People are rushing mm. to Germany, getting stem cells pre-COVID. Yep. People are getting young persons blood transfusions in the hope that it will yes. rejuvenate them. All this stuff is not mad. There is there's stuff behind it. So, for example, mm. NED boosters. People are getting infusions of mm. NED boosters. There, um, there's resveratrol. There's an anti-diabetic drug called metformin, um, mm. and so on. Now, when you give these to animals, mice. The mice live 20 or 30% longer in good health. Um, and it's amazing. So they're not lying about that. That's what, that's what happens. When mm. you give young blood, when you give young blood to an older animal, that older animal is rejuvenated a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so what's going on here? And, so, and the reality is human beings are more complicated. And just getting a nudge from a single anti-age just does not seem to be enough. The, the body's 
balance system. We don't have enough time to talk about it, but I talk about yeah, the book is, you is do. The, body, the body is in balance. Yes. If blood pressure goes up, there's a system to bring it down. If their hormones go up, there's a system to bring it down. There's a yin and yang. And at the cellular level, if you get oxidative stress, there's a system to bring it down. And as we mm. age and get battered by life, that system gets tilted towards aging. Mm. But the inherent thing in the body is if it gets prodded, it prods back. It's stubborn. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's cussed and it pushes back. So when, some, you know, when you go in and you get your NAD booster, the body says, bugger this, and pushes back on it. So, it. so we haven't found the right way to actually push it back. The young blood story is fascinating. It's, um, it's a notion, and it's a very ancient notion, going back to ancient times, is that there's something in young people, which is the elixir of youth. And if mm-hmm. only old people could get it, then we would be magically rejuvenated. <laughs> and what they've done in experiments is they've attached old mice to young mice with the hypothesis that the young mice will rejuvenate the older mice. You know what happens? The, the younger mouse gets clapped out. In other words, oh. the, young, the younger mouse ages. Wow. Um, when you go off, you know, now it's true that stem cells, which originate tissue, do age. And so in theory, putting in young stem cells should work. Yeah. But in fact, when you put young stem cells into an old body, the stem cells age, no matter what age these stem cells were. There's something in an older person Mm. And what it partly is, is that as you um, age, your body doesn't get rid of dead cells as well. And mm. you get half living cells surviving. And they're like grumpy old neighbors who phone the cops at <laughs> five past 10 that there's still a noise coming from your house. Um, and that's exactly what happens with the, this. And so they exude all these compounds that mm. create an aging environment. And what happens is it's not the young blood that is rejuvenating it's dilution so somebody has done an experiment where they gave saline and albumin to to uh, to older animals and if i've done it to humans as well and you get signs of reversal of of um, of oxidative stress in the aging process so there's something in that but it's not young blood it's there's something that older people are we increasingly harbor inside ourselves that perpetuates mm. this aging process. Sorry, that was a long answer. But oh, yeah. that was that's fantastic. There's so much there. I mean, the part that's um, that you come back to about balance, and I, I would that's just so beautifully discussed in the book, and it and and teaches people about homeostasis is what we're talking about essentially. Um, the way the body regulates itself is exercise. Now, uh, going back to some of those basics, I mean, your book does a very good job of canvassing what's exciting and what has potential and what has failed translating from mice, for example, to human studies. But we come back to these basic things and the way you describe what exercise does to the body um, draws on a lot of what you just described. Do you, do you want to elaborate on how, just how important exercise is at any age? Yes, I mean, people tend to focus on cardiovascular fitness and muscle strength with you know, the, those very practical outcomes of exercise. And both are really important. So, you know, if you, if you don't do any exercise, even with exercise, your cardiovascular fitness does tend to decline with age. It's the ability to get oxygen from your lungs into your blood is the crude way of measuring it. But muscle strength is really important because your muscles wear away as you get older. And you, so to, to get to be uh, as young as possible, as old as possible, you want to have strong muscles and you want to have a very fit cardiovascular system. But that's just the surface of, the, of, of, of exercise. And it, and it doesn't work independently. And it works not in, in, in hand and glove with your diet. But what happens with exercise that's reasonably intense, at least moderate intensity, is that it helps to clear out these dead cells, for example. And yeah. it, it, it counteracts the oxidative stress in your body. Um, the, the actual aging process does tend to settle down a bit when you, when you take exercise. It's not just your heart and blood vessels. It's not just your muscles. It's the cellular effects as well. And those yeah. cellular effects are exaggerated when there's a calorie gap. So most of these supplements that people are, are saying are anti-aging, what they're trying to do is emulate the one thing that's known to work about staying younger longer in every species that's been studied, and it looks as though it works in humans. And that's 
having a calorie gap in your life. So people call it either dietary restriction or calorie restriction. Maybe ten percent, twenty percent. Some people say it has to be thirty mm. percent. And that's you know. And so people say, well, what about you know the five two diet? What about time restricted eating and so on? But the, the point here is that when you reduce your calories, your body learns that you've reduced your calories and it reduces how much calories you burn at rest, your basic metabolic rate. And, um, and so you lose that effect with time if you really you know, dramatically reduce your calories. So the way to maintain the calorie gap, uh, this is partly work by Professor Luigi Trantana at Sydney University, on whose work, by the way, Michael Mosley based a lot of his early books, um, is that you maintain that calorie gap with exercise. So that so it's not just muscles, it's not just cardiovascular fitness, it's creating a calorie gap in your life as, as well. So there's a lot that's going on there and it's a complex mm. activity. You know, the, it, it's simplistic to think that just nudging with an NAD boosters is gonna push this homeostasis back to the mm. vertical. I talk about this like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The, yeah, you imagine Tower of, P, Tower of Pisa when it's just freshly built it's nice straight under down, down the line, and then the vagaries of life, you know, battery of life pushes the leaning tire of Pisa towards aging, and it's a devil of a job to get it back up. And just nudging it with a simple booster, the NAD booster or anti aging, it's just not going to be enough to do it. Whereas diet, exercise are really all encompassing and really do help to move you up. Now, it probably it, it is quite likely that in the future they'll find the right way to give these anti aging compounds. I mean, what's fascinating there is that the body, it may be by confusing the body, you know, taking them in very low doses, finding the right cocktail, maybe only taking them once a fortnight. Um, mm. There's all sorts of strategies that may work in the end, but we don't know yet. Mm. Now, I would ask you a, you a question because we're coming towards the end, and I'm fascinated yep. to know the answer. I mean, having gone through what we, you know, there are fewer traumatic experiences than you've gone through, and you've come through the other end. Um, you've trained in medicine, you know, hard to get in. And you, and you talk about your early life as well. So um, I want to know two things. The first thing I want to know is you came through a lot of adversity as a child and adolescent, and you've got to read the patient doctor to find what that's all about. And you come through a medical, surgical crisis in your life. How do you think that's changed you as a doctor? or made you a different doctor from the people that you see around you? Yeah. Uh, I, I, to be honest, um, Norman, I'm still working that out. Um, the, the, the early stuff, the childhood stuff, um, it, you know, it was, there was some challenges there. It was by no means horrific, but it was challenging. And I think that builds a um, acceptance that things might not always be amazing and that you have to kind of get on with making what you want out of things. It also, you know, growing up in a um, working class family, um, you know, in, in different socioeconomic strata like yourself, you, you, you approach people with a much more open-minded frame, um, less judgmental, um, because, you know, people in my family, um, you know, sometimes made decisions that weren't amazing, um, and it, and I, but they're still good people, and I understand that. And when I hear patient stories... For example, um, it can be tempting uh, if you just go by the facts and the textbooks to, you know, say, well, why don't you just stop eating or why don't you just stop, uh, you know, taking the extra opioids? But I understand that it's uh, it much, much more complicated than that. And as the, the cancer thing is a work in progress, um, and a lot of it is in the book, but I think what it gave me was a deep sense of vulnerability and a deep sense of powerlessness that I respect and appreciate in patients it brought home in uh, quite a dramatic way and i don't think you have to go through this pathway to develop that understanding of course but it made me realize that the routine for the doctor and the nurse is not not the routine for the patient the abnormal of the patient becomes normal for the doctor and the doctor can almost get a complacency because they've had 15, 10 conversations that week about this one illness or this one set of consequences. But for the person on the other side of that, it's a potentially life-changing conversation. And because I've, ha I've been on the other end of those conversations, both done well and done poorly, I take into every encounter with a patient that awareness that it's, it's, this is a special place where we're meeting doctors and patients and to, to fully respect that. Um, so, th so thank you for that, that question. 
Um, so, look, I, 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 before you try and take control again, I'm going to be. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's my second question. Um, sure. Nice, nice try, Ben. Nice try. Um, You're too good. Uh, is uh, well, you've chosen psychiatry, but nonetheless, you, you're now well into the system. You were you were a pawn in the system. Mm. Now you're moving into you know a position of power and control because you're, you're, you're training to become a consultant and so on. I, I, I mean, what are the two things maybe that you would change in the system to make it better for people? The first thing, it actually just is like your book. It comes back to some basics. I, I don't think it's fancy. I think to, the health system is a really complex organism and homeostasis is fragile. Balance is fragile within it. I would strip it, strip it back to basics. I think including a lot more diversity at medical school. So kind of it's this ultra competitive marks based uh, process of getting in. And I think you, you know, you need to know a certain amount of stuff. You need to have the capacity to study and memorize information, of course, but there's a whole other set of skills that people from all walks of life have. And I'm saying this as a white guy, with um, some privilege and social mobility, despite my story not being the classic Dr. Origin story, that if we opened up the door to that diversity, we would automatically, within a few years, start to see a whole range of different approaches, lived experience and personalities permeate the health system. The second thing is that we, as doctors, we focus a lot on the pathology and the diagnosis um, and less on the human side, which you naturally had as an actor that appreciated stories and storytelling, but we almost leave that learning up to chance. It's almost like they'll just learn that on the job where very few schools do an excellent job at elevating listening and teamwork and leadership and validation, which are the things that patients notice. Yes, they want the right antibiotic and yes, they want the, a technically excellent surgeon but the things they carry with them long after those experiences have resolved, long after the fever's gone down and the wounds have healed, is how they felt at the time. And that's largely driven by their interaction with healthcare providers. But we teach very little of that, which people call the art of medicine. So I would like to see that formalized and then elevated as important as any fact in any textbook or any exam on pharmacology, for example. Yeah, and you're right. And the you know, the, the health, the safety people, the safety and quality people in healthcare keep on talking, banging on about the airline industry. I mean, there's two things about the mm. airline industry. One is the doctor doesn't go down with the patient, um, whereas the pilot does. But, yes, the, second, yes. but the, the second thing is that it's it's rare for a pilot to be taken out of the seat for technical incompetence. The assumption is that you're technically competent. You know what you're going to mm. do. Mm. You're taken out of the seat because they're social interaction, their interaction skills, their managerial skills, their communication skills are down and they endanger the plane because they, you know, they don't, they, they, they can't communicate. And we don't, you know, the assumption is that most doctors know what they're doing. It's just, yes. they're, they're crap at some involving efficient <laughs> communication. And, and, and that's reflected in the complaint data. So I talk about in the book complaints to the, you know, safety and quality commission and the healthcare complaints commission and the co communication is always in the top three um of complaints that people make because that's something that gets people really upset long after they've healed physically from their illness um can i have control again you can thank you thank you so much um look dr swan it's can been I absolutely feel empowered, can i feel empowered ben i, mean, I do yeah. thank you <laughs> so much <laughs> um look everybody i want to thank everyone for joining us including the very talented dr swan uh, it's been amazing to hear you, your insights in this book that we've just touched, touched, touched the surface. This is a rich uh, text. Uh, everybody at any age will learn a lot. Um, I think it's a text that I will go back and consult as I age because you've got stuff there for every decade of life. Uh, I'm in my 40s and I went straight to that chapter, but I will move on. Um, uh, thanks for everybody for their emojis and comments. Um, to wrap up, uh, uh, every, uh, I just wanted to say that Norman's book is available at booktopia.com.au now. Uh, As I've is been the out patient in... doctor, so buy that thank, one Thank well. you, thank you. And I've been out at bookstores uh, yesterday up in Brisbane, and your book is everywhere, Dr. Swan. 
Um, so people should, should be able to rush out right now and buy it. Um, uh, so we have run out of time. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties early on, but we got we got Norman back. If you've enjoyed the, uh, this discussion, again, my book is available, The Patient Doctor. Norman's book, So You Want to Live Younger, Longer, um, is available at Booktopia. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Swan. Thank you, Booktopia. <laughs>